So how you been? I, I've been well. Uh, monasticism is well designed for pandemics. <laughs> it's, it's like nothing's much changed for us. Uh, we have less guests, that's the most obvious. So we kind of miss our friends from here, there and everywhere. But our life kind of carries on and so we just finished a, uh, a three month retreat, January, February, March, which is part of the great privilege of being a bhikkhu, but also the duty uh, of a bhikkhu to develop the craft of meditation and then hopefully share those insights with uh, with friends, lay friends or whoever. Um, but most, the kind of most important of monastic life is when we ordain, we ordain for the realization of Nibbana. That's the, that's actually in the, in the chants that we do. Um, so building a monastery is, is okay. Um, doing retreats is okay. But if the, if the monastic community not, are not aspiring to the highest aspiration, then who's going to do it, right? So, so that's our, 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 our interest. Our interest is, well, what, did, what did the Buddha realize? You know, what was his realization? And why did he share his teaching in this particular way? And that's the sense of curiosity I've always had. I, I didn't ordain to be a Buddhist, right? I, I mean, you could call me one, I suppose. <laughs> but that wasn't really the raison d'etre of my ordination. It was to realize um, profound peace or deep silence, which I used to have as a, as a, as a young kid. I'd, I'd wake up and... I remember trying to describe it to people. I'd say, well, I don't know what it was, but it was silent. And, and that's what it was, it was silent. And, and, and that, and those experiences would come when I woke up and I can't remember how old I was. I suppose I was like five, six, seven, eight, something like that, maybe a few times, like once a year. But those were such powerful experiences that they prevented me from getting an engineering degree because when I got into U of T, I said, well, this isn't going to make me silent. Um, and then I, you know, I traveled and I got to India and, and then eventually became a, a bhikkhu. So that, that the Buddhist teaching on, on Nibbana and, and the peacefulness and the silence of, of what that might mean has um, drawn me obviously very strongly because I've kind of stuck it out uh, as a monk. Um, so in, in, in that vein, in terms of meditation, um, so one, just one thing is that I, I assume that most of you have a good grounding in the Four Noble Truths. Uh, if you don't, then if there's stuff that I say that you don't understand because of that context, then it's good to study the Four Noble Truths to kind of formally look at the, the patterns and, and get some books that describe it quite well. I'm sure Lynn would have a, a reading list around that or, or Eleanor. Um, and and get, the, get the knowledge down, get the basic knowledge of Four Noble Truths. And, and, and then from that, that gives you a kind of reflective, contemplative um, model that, that you can work with. Because it's obviously liberation isn't about uh, knowledge. Uh, as I was saying yesterday to the Ottawa group, I, I took the canoe out onto Pike Lake a, a few days ago when it was warm. And uh, there were, uh, there's a family of otters just, just out like 20, 30 meters from the shoreline, four otters. And, you know, they're just, like super cute. And uh, so then, you know, like, like most people, I like collective nouns. I suppose you do too. So like, what's the collective noun for a group of otters? So I look it up and it's a, it's a raft of waters, isn't that nice? A raft of waters, but now that's knowledge, but that's not going to liberate me. It'll be a good party trick next time. <laughs> I'm in some kind of function, do you know? But that's not really liberation, that's just information. So li liberation is about wisdom. And, and, and so, so, so what is wisdom? Intuition, what, is, what does wisdom really mean? Well, if you come, if you come to the uh, Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, the first statement of the Eightfold Path is there is right understanding. 
So right understanding, when I read, read, first read that, I thought, well, I have to get some answer, some conclusion, some information so that I understand. Well, yeah, I needed, I needed teaching, so I studied. But latterly, I realized that, well, right understanding is when I open my mind to this moment and know it just as it is. So I'm looking at the shrine and these lovely purple violets. And I look at that and I just see, well, this is truth. This moment, the way it feels is truth. And that's what Dharma is. It's the truth of the way things are. And then if I look at that shrine and then I think, ah, oh, someone didn't change the flowers. What kind of monastery is this? These monks are really sloppy. That's something I'm creating that's being created through thought and habit or whatever. So right understanding, not as a, a, a statement, but as a existential experience, it's like this. And this is why if you've been listening to Lumpo Sumedho's beautiful talks of late, that's what he's hammering home all the time. It's like this. But to actually do that, you have to compose and collect the mind and notice the way things are. And, and, and our minds, of course, run past future, past future, past future, planning, worrying, and we, we experience a very little of sense of composure. So I see meditation as that sense of composure. And why I say this is because I don't, I don't use the word concentration so much for meditation. Um, I use it for other things. And I'm coming more from the Thai tradition that translates Sama Samadhi as presence and, and Jit Boom, it means like a collected mind or a composed mind. And, and so, like I was saying to the auto group yesterday, if I, so I've got a microphone in front of me here. And if I focus and concentrate, I can just make out the company's name is Five, five Fine. And then there's some letters underneath that. And I really, I have to really focus and get close. And then, oh yeah, it says volume. So that's concentration. And, and, and what I'm concerned about is the object. Right? I want to know something about the object that I latch on to the object. Nibbana cannot be an object. It can't, it can't be a, an objective experience because all objective experiences change. And, and Nibbana is the unchanging. It's the unchanging piece, which is kind of behind all experience. So if my, and, and this is, you know, for, very important for me because where I'm coming from, if my mind is always paying attention to external objects, which I need to do sometime, much of the time, but if, if that's the only thing I do, and the external objects can be thought and emotions and all of that too, so if my attention is always in objects and focusing, then I'm not available for that which is not an object, which is the silence of the mind. The, the experiences of good, bad, love, hate, um, beauty, ugliness, they arise and cease in the silence of awareness. And the silence of awareness kind of eludes us because we are out into objective experience. At least this is, this is how I practice. So, Back to meditation, I like the word composure and collectedness with the way things are rather than concentration on the way things are. Now, maybe those words don't, you know, aren't so significant for you, but they're very meaningful for me because if I'm, if I'm sitting here and I just allow sight to take place, seeing, and I just let it be the way it is, then the mind has composure. I can do that with sound. So let's say there's a sound outside, whatever, and I just allow listening to take place. And there's the silence of knowing, the silence of awareness. If I, if I take the tactile feelings of my hands and I just close my eyes maybe and just feel the pressure and warmth of my hands, and there's the silence again. So the silence of awareness didn't depend on the visual object, didn't depend on the audio object, and didn't depend on the tactile object. But the visual object points back to the silence, the audio 
object points back to the silence. The tactile object points back to the silence. So that silent knowing or awareness, not knowing in terms of intellect or concept, but in sense of presence, consciousness, awareness, knowing what's going on. Uh, that's always there. And that's why it's the kind of entryway in, into what the Buddha's realization was about. Now, if, and, and so I ask you, you know, many of you have been meditating a long time. Um, does that make sense to you? Like, or, or does the word concentration, do you like that word better? But just consider what you're doing in, in, in your meditation. Um, so if, if, if one is kind of taking that line of approach, then whatever object of meditation you choose um, should be to some extent appealing, right? You should kind of find it inviting or interesting. Um, and, 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 and it should be something that you could um, compose the mind with. So you have to have an affinity to the type of meditation you're doing. So if some, say if I suggest some uh, mode of meditation and it doesn't work for you, then it doesn't work for you. Then you try something else. It's not that I'm wrong or you're wrong. It's just, you don't have an affinity to that. We can all meditate. You can all compose the mind. So that, you know, a teacher can't say, maybe on a one-on-one -on -one discussion, one can say, yeah, try this or try that. So there are many, many, many ways to, to um, many objects of, of awareness, but it's of meditation, but it seems to me that the composure is not different. Like the composure I hear, I hear with a, like if I chant a mantra, I can sense the silent knowing behind that. Yeah? Um, so that's, that's where I'm coming from <laughs> in, in, in terms of, uh, of what, I, what I find useful. And, and these are all for reflection. I'm not kind of taking a position about this. It's just this, what I find useful. Um, okay, so I think that's sort of okay for an introduction. Let's, um, let's do some meditation. We'll, we'll meditate for 45 minutes, right, Lynn? Yeah? Um, and I'll give some instruction in the beginning, but then I'll be quiet because the quietness is nice. And just see, see how it feels. See what works for you. So take a posture where you can you be fairly still. Stillness is a really lovely quality of mind and body. Fidgetiness is fidgetiness. So if you can be still, helps a lot. I'll just get my little clock here. Okay. So close your eyes and come into the present moment. So establish this sense of, of knowing. First of all, just like, what do you feel like sitting here now? Very ordinary. And, and you don't really need an answer to that. It's just like, like composing the mind on this present moment. And, and to sort of heighten that sense of presence, listen to sound. Let sound become conscious. So you're not kind of going out to sound, you're just allowing sound to be present in consciousness. So you're not looking for something or getting rid of anything, just listening and notice the silence of awareness. So the silence is always there. You don't have to get it in the future. You just have to remember to listen. Just 
Change the sense base, feel your hands. Just allow the feelings and the hands to become conscious. And composure, the silence of knowing. Same silence of knowing. Back to sound. Notice or perceive sound as in awareness. So this gives a sense of space to awareness that sound is in awareness. It's a perception. So rather than me being in the body and the sound being out there, sound is in awareness. And you go to your hands and notice that the tactile feeling of the hands is an objective experience in awareness. So they're the same in that sense. And there's the silent knowing. So now feel the breathing of the body, allow the breathing of the body to become conscious. Wherever you feel it, doesn't really matter. And there's the silent knowing with breathing. So I like to express it this way, awareness with breath rather than on the breath. Again, maybe that doesn't make a difference to you, but it does to me. So practicing silent awareness with one whole in breath and silent awareness with one whole out breath. Now, within this, thoughts will come and go. They're just a part of the nature of mind. And I would suggest that when you notice thought, then you, most people tend to try to get rid of thought. This is an error. It doesn't work because you're not the thinker. The thoughts arise from past habits and conditions and so on. So what you want to notice more is the moment when you awaken you know that there's thinking, that's actually a moment where thought has stopped. So this is like a gap between thoughts. The end of a thought. So practicing silent knowing, awareness with an in-breath, with an out-breath, and then noticing the end of a thought. And there's the same silent awareness. So those are some general principles. Let's just sit quietly. And I won't give any more instruction and, and um, experiment, see how that works. <laughs> 